succeeded. You know? Yeah. Do you ever go hunting for treasure? Oh, metal detector. Well, they do that on the beach at the, at the Gulf of Mexico all the time. I see. Nothing you wanted to keep. Yeah. All right. All right. Some of us in one form or another probably has looked for treasure. Uh, maybe we haven't found much. But if you found something, you'd seek for what its value and benefit was to you. An earthen vessel containing a treasure. Hmm. It's not in the outback necessarily. It's in the comfort of your own house. Comfort of church. Comfort of your car. And wherever you are. There's a treasure contained in each one of us that know him. We have a notable treasure wherever we go and whatever we face. Last week we spoke of conforming to the image. What hinders us? Perhaps we don't know what is available or we don't know what God sees when he looks at us. Have you ever wondered what God sees when he looks at you? God esteems our new birth as a new creation. Our past is no more. We are now one spirit with him. Some of us are not very pleased with our past. And, but I found there's an, a solution to that from God's point of view. Sin, to the believer, has been removed. As far as the east is from the west. You go east, you'll never come to west. You keep going east. Now, wouldn't it be good if all of us looked at our lives like that? What is now under the blood, I can't chase it down. What effect should I have on my life? I'm a new person. That's how he views me. And the following verses from this lesson this morning will, will give us a view of that, maybe another view or other views, but it also contains in it how we should react to the treasure. In 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, the New Testament believers are a category all their own, containing a treasure. Verse 9, uh, we're special. You know that we're special? We're special. You, we're special. Yeah. He's going to tell us about it right here. You are, ye are, you are a chosen generation. Ooh. A chosen generation. That's not... A time frame in this case. It is kin, race, nation. You are a royal priesthood. Now that's just how we look at ourselves, don't we? You are a royal priesthood. You're <laughs> kings and priests. Absolutely. Let me add a, a verse. Let me insert one or two here. Revelations 1.6 and hath made us. You're his. He has made you, made you, past tense, a king and a priest. Where? What for? Who to? Unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion. Well, we learn more about dominion come Wednesday. But this is Krodos. It's might, power, strength, forever 
and ever. Amen. Now, hang on. See, I, I sometimes think we don't think in his terms. Or we don't recognize certain events. If he has made us a king and a priest, whose choice was that? Yes, absolutely. It was his choice. His choice to make you a king and a priest. You could say, thank you, Father, for making me a king and a priest. But it behoves us that we accept his choice. You say, well, no. I want each one of us to agree with him. Okay? So we can say, as of this moment, he has made us kings and priests. Think we could say that? We are made kings and priests unto God. Did you say it? You thought it? Well, say it out loud sometime. <laughs> you know? We, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Now that sounded pretty good. Now you're going to do better with the next one, all right? Yeah. I, for 11 years, you've been the quietest bunch I've ever seen. <laughs> Okay? But I, I, I think I detect a sense that we might be loosening up just a tad. Okay, let's, let's move on to Revelations 5.10 and see what it tells us. What is it? Hath made us unto our God, what? Kings and priests. You ought to be convinced pretty soon. Huh? And, oh, if we're not done with it. He has made, made us. Got it? Let's do it in pieces. Made me. A king and priest unto God. And we shall reign on the earth. Ah. Oh, boy. That's an expectation. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're not done. We're going back to we're going back to First Peter two. I don't know if it's nine or ten, but Bill will figure it out. No, let's try nine again. Let's start with the, and you are a chosen generation. A ro you are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are what? You can say it. That don't mean you're odd. All right? It don't mean you're odd. You are a peculiar people. Now, hello, peculiar. Peculiar. Let me do this with you. Okay? I actually wrote that in a, in a, I was being interviewed by the Assembly of God in Detroit. And they wanted me to write down something. And I just told them I was a peculiar person. I didn't know how to spell it, but I turned around, there it was on a box. <laughs> okay? But I didn't know this. But it seemed to fit very well. So here we go. Let's define this peculiar people. The Amplified Bible renders this as God's own purchased special people. Has God purchased you? Yes, and you're his people. Special people. The American Standard says a people of God's own possession. That's you, me. New International Version says a people belonging to God. That's us. All right. Why? That you should show forth the praises of him, or by words and deeds added, who hath called us out of darkness, out of ignorance, unbelief, and sin into his marvelous light. Verse 10, which in times past was not a people, but we are now a people of God, which has attained mercy, but 
had not obtained mercy, but now has obtained mercy. Obtained mercy. God was with me, right? He found me, found you. He had compassion by word or deed, specifically by divine grace. To be an object of gracious favor, saving mercy, unmerited favor, undeserved favor. Now the question is, that's what he has provided. All right? Now, these provisions as our inheritance, do we embrace them? Yes. yes. Oh, oh, I just... Yes, we do. We embrace them. Do we realize these provisions were basically offered to Israel and they turned them down? They did not embrace them. Whoa. It, why? They acted by backing out, then ruling out the fullness of these provisions. Why? Due to fear. Mm -hmm. Expectation and side effects were too much for them. Now let's reach back in time. Israel has been miraculously delivered from Egypt. Before they left, God provided great supernatural signs for them. Events. As they were being delivered, great supernatural signs and events. Well, what, anything from the parting of the Red Sea to, to manna to water out of a rock and so on it went. An army swallowed up by a river. Sea. Red Sea. Sea. Okay. Got that? Hmm. Now that would seem like it would make some great impression to us. But for three months this went on from Egypt to Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19, uh, beginning with verse 3, Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and now I bear you on eagle wings. I looked that up. Lifted you? Carried you? On eagle wings. Deuteronomy 32.11 has an interesting verse. As an angel stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So me being me. What's this, what's this thing called? Google? <laughs> That's what they call that? Google? Yeah, you, you, can, you can look at me kind of mystified because, hello. I mean, I'm on an adventure if I go look at Google. You identify with that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to know about this eagle wing thing, carrying their young. Well, I run head on into it. They said, it's been said for a long time, but we're not sure that that's fact. Other than they went ahead and gave personal testimony of people that had seen it happen, where the young come out of the nest, the eagle swoops down, settles it on their wings, and delivers them to safety. Is that not what God said he was doing to the children of Israel? Exactly what he said he was doing to the children of Israel. Hello. Now, what's, he says, and I brought them to myself. So God's intent was to deliver them and fellowship with them. In verse 5, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, keep my covenant, he's talking to Israel, then you shall be a peculiar treasure. Mm, so we are, rightfully, a treasure, are we not? Absolutely. You are a treasured possession. Israel has to be, was to be God's treasure. Unto me, above how many people? Now, isn't that a stirring set of events? He says, I'm going to elevate you, carry you above all the people. Is that what he just got through telling us? That's what he got. You recognize that? <laughs> We live like that? Hmm. Uh, you are a treasured possession. Israel was to be God's treasure unto all people. For all the earth is mine. And ye shall be a what? Kingdom of priests. Ye shall be a holy nation. These are the words that were spoken to the children of Israel. Isn't that just what we quoted earlier? Hmm. So Israel had the opportunity. Let's see what Israel did with it. In Exodus 19.8, they answered and accepted 
And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words unto the Lord. Uh-huh. And throughout the 19th chapter, here comes a set of circumstances. So the people had to prepare themselves to hear what God had to say via Moses. On the third morning, here comes God. <laughs> here we come. Not quite what they expected. Thunders, lightning, thick cloud, trumpet exceedingly loud. God's coming. Okay. And Moses brought the people to meet God. Wow, ah, smoke and fire as the Lord descended and the mountain quaked. Mm -mm -mm. He's on his way. The trumpet got louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered by a voice. Now, these people we're going to find weren't very comfortable. All right? When God comes to visit you, I've never heard much noise. Somebody was talking the other day about the presence of God and what it does. I only found one time in my life where I was all ready to call him off because I didn't think I could stand anymore. I didn't think I could breathe. I was running out of breath. That was an abnormal time, all right? Never had another time like that to this point. Unusual? Fear? No. I'd take another one. <laughs> or multiples. I really would. So anyhow, in Exodus 20, the next chapter, here comes the Ten Commandments. Now in verse 18 through 21, the people gets to choose. We always get to choose. Always we get to choose. Their choice was to remove, and they stood afar off. And it's stated such in book verse 18 and verse 21. They chose to remain onlookers, not participants. Israel chose to decline being God's treasure, standing in his presence. Well, what happened? Time rolled on. The Apostle Paul picks up the story with Moses coming down that mountain, and he picks it up in 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, and we're going to come into this at verse 13. And you can read the whole chapter, okay? I'd, if, if you want to go back and read Exodus 19 and Exodus 20, there's more in there than what I've shared here this morning. And there's more in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. So, but here I'm going to pick up at 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the end of that which was abolished. The glory that was manifest was, and, and the law was to be changed. And in this case, the law was to be abolished, or the glory of the law was to be abolished, done away with. But in that point, Moses' face shone because he visited with God there. The veil, the, cover, the covering, kept the Israelites from gazing on the glory of God, reflected upon the, on Moses' face, just as the Old Testament law kept them from beholding the fullness of God's love and favor and grace. The veil concealed his glory. Contrast that. Jesus gave us a full look at the glory of God through showing us the perfect love of God by loving us first. He didn't love us because we're pretty. He didn't love us because we're ugly. He just loved us because we're his, his creation. He just loved all. But in this case, in verse 14, Israel's minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. As the physical veil was upon Moses' face, Paul was saying that a spiritual veil was over Israel's minds and hearts until this day, or until what he describes, which veil is done away 
in Christ. In Christ there is no veil to the presence, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of God. He's not hiding it from you anymore. It's there for you, a treasure for you to mine. And it's in you, stored there already. Mine it. In verse 15, and even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, their heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Verse 17, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I think what we need to understand is this. Spirit is not limited as we are. Okay? We have a body. It limits us. Spirit, here's an interesting thing. You wonder how you can store a treasure inside you? Huh? Spirit can penetrate the human body and live within the human heart without displacing anything human. You believe on him, he makes you a new creation. He makes you a living treasure or containers of living treasure or a living container of living treasure, however you want to say it. And the treasure keeps giving and giving and giving. You can't spend it. No. It adds, adds, adding to the treasure of the Lord his wisdom, knowledge, and power. Thus, there is liberty, manifesting the glorious conditions of God's life in us. Verse 18. But we all, with open or unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You say, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the glory. If, if that is your condition, or is that your thought process, go home and read the 17th chapter of John. Jesus is praying for us, the disciples and us. He says to God, the glory you gave me, I have given them. It's part of the treasure. It's there. Wow. You say, glory. Glory. The character and acts of God in self-manifestation what he, what he is and what he does, according to Vine's dictionary. Now we're changed into, and well, some of you might hope, I trust he changed me into something. But look, I want you to look at something. Remember, I said God's made divine choices. Do you realize he's bound himself by those divine choices in this dispensation in which we live? He set the parameters and made the choices. We get to say, I want his choice. Mm. So here we go. Changed into. The word is to transform, transfigure, and a word called metamorphosis. What is metamorphosis? A caterpillar to what? To a butterfly. That's how he treats you. Changed. We're transformed, transfigured, metamorphosed. God designed by his creative choice that a caterpillar metamorphoses to a beautiful butterfly. Also by his creative choice, we are changed into the same, his cha same spiritual image. Does that sound too far out? No, I trust not. You say, I don't understand. I'm not sure sometimes I understand. Okay? But I'm, I'm learning. That's where dominion then and dominion now comes from. With the desire to share it, no less. I asked Dale this morning, I said, you ever heard anybody talk about it? He said, no. 
So here we go. Come Wednesday at 2 o'clock. All right. And it'll be a while because there's 16 pages of notes at this point. All right. So by his creative choice, we are changed into his or the same spiritual image. The veiled condition described is blindness of mind and a hidden gospel. This will be until the heart turns and receives the hidden treasure. Why would it be a problem to receive a treasure? Because the only other thing I can think of is we don't think of it as a treasure. Don't you want to explore the treasure? You found something in that sandbox. I was going to call it a cat box. But in, the, in that sandbox, you'd explore it, wouldn't you? Normally, if it was, you can have noticeable value to it. Hmm. Here we go. Colossians 2, 3. In whom, or in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Where does he abide today? In us. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him. <laughs> I, I shared it, but I'll just hit it a glancing blow. Years and years ago when the kids were about this tall, give or take, that's a long time ago when now one is 60 what? What is Tony, 60 what? 61? Wow, I got a baby, 61 years old. And I'm just starting maturity. I got the youngest one's 58, but they were both there. Living in a St. Joseph, Michigan. They had bunk beds in those days. And I can remember, I thought, I really need some wisdom. I went in the bedroom to the bottom bunk, knelt, and began to pray in their behalf, that I'd have wisdom. He give us wisdom to all men liberally and upbraid him a lot. Let him ask in faith believing. Huh? Uncover the treasure. Uncover the treasure. Let it out. All right. Treasure is hid. Secrets treasured. Concealed and stored up. This isn't just spiritual wisdom and knowledge. Spirit, just spiritual wisdom and knowledge. Just Treasure goes wherever you go. You don't work anymore. You're retired. I, I, you work. Yeah, but I'm tired. <laughs> You're tired. All, all right. Not retired, just tired. <laughs> okay, here we go. I pretty much lost my train of thought. <laughs> Think about this. Take him with you wherever you go. He is with you. He'll, he's got wisdom and knowledge about wells that Jim doesn't have yet, and he's only been at it 50 years. 52 years, okay? He's got more knowledge than you got. Yeah. Think about that. Take him with you. Take him to the grocery store. You do take him to the grocery store. Let him help you. Wherever you go, whatever you do, talk to him. Communicate with him. He'll share with you and you'll share with him. I tell you, and you're going to learn. Learn things you never knew. You're going to focus on things you don't know why you're focusing on them. But all of a sudden, it'll become more clear. Hmm, it's exciting. In fact, spiritual mindedness is a way of true life and peace. Blinded minds are defined in the Bible. We're going to Romans 8, 5, and 6, the Amplified Bible. Uh, and here's what it says. For those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit are controlled by the desires of the Spirit. They set their mind on and seek those things which gratify the Holy Spirit. Two different choices here. They're always faced with a choice. Always. Paul stated earlier in Romans that the wages of sin is death. The pay for that is as follows. 
as we look at verse 6 of Romans 8. Now the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit, is death. Death that comprises all the miseries arising from sin, and they are many. Because all he's doing, is Satan is doing, is stealing from you. All the miseries arising from sin, both here and hereafter, the mind of the Holy Spirit is life, as life as God has it, and soul peace, both now and forever. Isaiah 26, 3 simplifies this in some form. Thou, will, thou wilt keep, guard, protect, maintain him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in you. What you're doing when you're seeking is exploring the treasure. The renewing of the mind is the way of knowing the perfect will of God, Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world. Be transformed, metamorphosed, changed, transfigured by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that good, acceptable, and perfect good pleasure of God. I want to know that. This study began with me with three verses multiple, multiple years ago. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4 and 7. I'm going to read them to you and then I'm going to tell you a story in closing this morning. But even if our gospel, the glad tidings, also be hidden, obscured, and covered up with a veil that hinders the knowledge of God, it is hidden only to those who are perishing, obscured only to those who are spiritually dying, veiled only to those who are lost. For the God of this world has blinded the unbelievers' minds that they could not discern the truth, preventing them from seeing in the, the illuminating the, excuse me, the illuminating light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, the Messiah, who is the image and likeness of God. Verse 7, however, you and I possess this glorious treasure, the divine light of the gospel, in frail human vessels of earth, that the grandeur and the exciting, exceeding greatness of the power may be shown to be from God and not from ourselves. I have no idea. It might be 30, 40 years ago. This scripture was turning around inside me from a standpoint that people weren't believing because their minds were blinded. I found, and then I began to see, I could pray and take some of that pressure off, that darkness, where they could hear and begin to perceive and make a choice. Now, I'm of the opinion that I might have to go back and do that again. But I can do that. And I, I remember standing, well, maybe two stories. I remember standing in a, tent, in a uh, big, big building. And preaching, the invitation was being sung, and I said, whoever, whoever, words to the fact, whoever has a blinded mind that they may see and surrender. And about that point, here's a guy, person over on the other side moved. That's one illustration. Another illustration is the one I started out to tell you. OJ got a call, and it was a holiday. And the people wanted this in Grand Rapids. There was husband and wife, but I think it was the husband that was sick. And they had invited other people to come at the same time we were there. And so we went, and we, they led us right through to the bedroom. We went in and prayed with him. Come out, and the people wanted to talk. And amongst the conversation, they told about a relative that was in Manistee and his, part of his condition, and he didn't believe. And this thing, that verse just jumped up and become real. His mind is blinded to the glorious gospel of Christ. I said, can I just pray a moment? So we stopped everything and prayed that the glorious light of the gospel would shine to this man. We left. Run on one or two days, 
O.J. got another call. And that call said that this man that we prayed for was in the hospital in Manistee. And would we go? So we climbed in the car and headed for Manistee. It was a series of events. We got there, walked in the hospital, got to the room. The wife took off. We walked in, and they had that big-time wrestling stuff, you know, loud, oh, cranked right up. You could hardly hear yourself, you know, vibrate more or less. And nobody turned it down, and what'd you do? Well, it was only him and O.J. and I. O.J. went up one side, I went up the other, and we prayed. There's no talking, because all this noise. What'd you do? Basically, we turned around, walked to the end of the bed, walked out the door, <laughs> And, got, and here come the wife, said goodbye, got in the car, and left town to drive another 90 miles back home. You say, well, that was strange. And yes, it was. Yes, it was. Uniquer yet. We got a call. You know what happened? Don't have a clue. They, they, they took him down for their x-rays, or they took him down for surgery, and the doctor got mad. Because they took, I assume they took x-rays just before they took him down again, and he was hot. Who operated on this man anyhow? What it was is no longer there. I don't think that man was ever the same, probably, in all likelihood. Still don't know much about him. But the treasure was open, wasn't it? Yeah, the treasure was open. So, let us today view ourselves in Christ as God sees us, earthen vessels filled with his treasures. They're not ours, they're his. But the expression of them is through us. Father, we thank you, praise you, honor and glorify you. Thank you for the truth of the word. It is eternal, it is everlasting. You are patient and you are kind. Because whenever the heart changes, the veil is removed and the treasure is exposed conform to the image of Jesus with his inheritance manifested in us. Father, may we share it, live it, and get excited about it. We honor you this morning. Thank you for teaching us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody free? Yeah. Can I ask a prayer? Um, I, some of the scriptures you were um, sharing, I'm meeting with, um, doing a Bible study with someone at um, Buffalo Wild Wings. And, <laughs> okay. Um, the gospel and it's like the scriptures like with the eagle every I'm not saying every time but a lot of times when I pray for this person an eagle will fly overhead and um, you know like I shared with them you know even like God's story and freedom and so just that I can wrap everything together for this person and, and the light will shine mm -hmm. expose the treasure grab your wife by the arm and 